Good to go. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're still recording. All right. All right, well, welcome everyone to the second episode now of the uh, CPU extravaganza uh, that we... Uh, let me start that over. <laughs> Part D. <laughs> Part D. All right, well, welcome back to the second episode of our uh, 2019 CPU launch extravaganza series. Um, without getting too far ahead, I do want to uh, reintroduce Matt. He was on the very first episode of the Puget Podcast. Um, so, Matt, you've been kind of diving in over the past uh, few weeks. Uh, we did, co uh, to take a step back, we, we did cover in the previous episode with uh, Josh Ray, a product manager, covered with him kind of the landscape and, and what CPUs are out there and what CPUs are available now. Um, but can you dive in a little bit as to what the past few weeks, now that those launched, what that has looked like for you? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I cover a couple of different things, but I, I believe we want to start with uh, photography, correct? Yes. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, it's, it's a really interesting, um, just because of all, all these launches and all these things, they're all like competing on performance and price and all that stuff. I'm sure you covered in the last episode, but, um, the really, really interesting thing when it comes to like photographers isn't as much a lot of the stuff that you'll see like in terms of marketing from like Intel or AMD. The biggest thing is actually a really interesting interaction between uh, a lot of these processors and Lightroom actually. Uh, so Lightroom is, I mean, most photographers will either use it or be super familiar with it. Um, I mean, there's alternatives out there, but the big thing that we found is that in Lightroom, it just loves AMD processors hmm. um, for specific tasks. And we've, you know, talked with Adobe, we've talked with Intel and AMD, and you know, the exact reason why I'm sure there's a bunch of theories, and they probably know, but like for well, is us, that, is that unique to these new processors, or no, is that a, kind it, of well, a historical thing? Kind, we're not sure. Okay. Uh, so historically, we've seen evidence of some of this going on, where like AMD is favored, but the AMD processors were not like exactly right to really be able to leverage that. Like Intel was still able to bowl through and be faster overall anyway, or is close enough that like, man, we didn't really notice it in our benchmarks. Right. But with these, uh, the AMD, both the Ryzen processors and the Threadrippers, uh, the performance gain is getting so much that now we're, we really started to notice uh, this better performance with AMD CPUs. And it's specifically with uh, two tasks that we've seen. It's exporting, which I mean, everybody exports, and uh, generating smart previews. So those specific two things, and like smart previews, like that's important mostly for you know people that are on the go laptops. Um, I mean they can be used on desktops too if you just want to um, you know be able to do things quicker in the editing process and you're doing it very involved. Uh, but the exporting is really the, the big deal, and it's to the point that um, so so taking like the AMD Ryzen CPUs versus the Intel ninth gen CPUs, and those are mostly comparable in price. The uh, Ryzen CPUs I think are something like twice as fast for exporting. Hmm. And so that's pretty big deal. I yeah. mean, f for a lot of like the, what we tend to call active tasks, like, uh, you know, calling images and switching between modules and trying to use the brush and until it starts lagging out, uh, that stuff is all pretty much the same between Intel and AMD. Like for, you spend X dollars on a processor, you're gonna get about the same performance either way. But it's this performance when exporting where suddenly AMD is twice as fast. And it actually extends to the Threadripper CPUs. So Ryzen is twice as fast, roughly, as the Intel 9th gen. Uh, and then you have, from the Ryzen CPUs to Threadripper is about twice as fast again. So you could go from a, if it takes four minutes to export, um, you know, however many pictures, you'd go down to two minutes with Ryzen or go down to one minute with Threadripper. Wow. So, so no more coffee breaks. Yeah, no more coffee breaks. You don't get that time <laughs> to stretch and you know, go to get coffee or go get lunch. I mean, but what's kind of interesting out of all of this stuff is we're almost to the point now where exporting performance isn't critical anymore. Um, I mean, it was in the past where, you know, when it's going to take you a day to export your pictures and your system is just locked up and sitting there, well, yeah, that's super important. But now we're getting down to the point where you can export, like, I might be off by a factor of 10. It's either 50 <laughs> or 500 pictures. I'd have to double check the numbers uh, in like 30 seconds. And wow. so e even if it's 50 pictures in 30 seconds, that's, that's faster than a picture a second. And, you know, at that point, you know, if you're going to be doing it, you know, even, you know, large like sports, sports shooting or wedding photography, 
and you have a hundred, you know, five hundred or a thousand pictures, it's it's just not a bottleneck as right. much anymore. So at least that does help you kind of draw that line, though, mm -hmm. in figuring out which CPU would make sense yeah. uh, for which people. Yeah, it really does. I mean, right now we're trying to push, um, or recommending, I should say, rather than push, um, AMD Ryzen is what we are recommending for people doing photography stuff. And that's simply because at the same price, it's the same as Intel for the active tasks, but as soon as you get into things like exporting, it's so much faster, so you might as well. Uh, one of the big questions is, is it then worth it to go up to Threadripper? Because from the top end Ryzen, the 3950X is like $750 at retail, versus the Threadripper at the lowest end of this new series is like 1300 or something like that. Hmm. Um, so that's almost a doubling in price. Is a doubling in price worth cutting your export time and just really your export time in half and not right. affecting anything else? That's so so that, that's where it's just that much more important to be having that conversation mm -hmm. with someone that actually knows what they're talking about um, to, to help kind of do that justification and that ROI yeah. basically. Because yeah. I mean, that's a lot of money that, you know, if if export time taking you know one minute instead of 30 seconds, if that doesn't really matter to you, then save that money, spend it on like a nice lens that you know is going to actually affect sure. your photography, right. and you know and do that or faster storage or I mean people never I don't think I've ever heard anyone say oh I got too much storage in my computer after right. they've had it for a few years. Yep. You can always take that money and put it there, and you'll never be unhappy about that. Right. So is, is that is that all of your are those your main takeaways for yeah, photography mostly, specifically? Mostly for photography, yeah. I mean, there's you know all the other applications that people are going to be using. Uh, Photoshop, it's pretty much just Intel and AMD are about on par, and there's no reason to go with the uh, what are called the HEDT, the high right. high perform. Wait, no, that doesn't work. Whatever it is, high end desktop uh, CPUs like uh, the X series of the Threader, but there's just not no point. Um, you could be getting into like Capture One Pro. That's one that we haven't really done a huge amount of testing so far, but I wouldn't expect there to be really much different there either. It probably doesn't have that same quirk as Lightroom, um, so you're just it's it's a you, it's not as big of a deal, I think, in a lot of those other applications. Right. Okay. So let's uh, if that's the case, let's go ahead and pivot over to video editing then. Sure. So like traditionally, how do a lot of uh, NLEs tend to use uh, CPUs and and then from there, uh, what impact are these new CPUs going to have? Yeah, okay. So um, the analyses that we typically are gonna be focusing on right now is gonna be Premiere Pro or DaVinci Resolve. I'm um, just put that so people know where, kind of where we're coming from. Um, and- They don't wanna dive into Abbott? Uh, not yet. <laughs> One, two. I don't think we can right now. Uh, and the CPU uh, is just, it's, it's such a core part of performance for any of any application, period. Uh, a lot of these NLEs now are starting to leverage the video card now for more and more stuff. DaVinci Resolve is really good at that when you get into the open effects and noise reduction. Um, but even Premiere Pro, like uh, all the blurs, not, maybe not all, most of the blurs, Lumetri Color, uh, a lot of this stuff is being moved onto the GPU because it's just so efficient on there. But the CPU is still core to all of this stuff, especially when it comes to like exporting, you know, exporting. A lot of people seem to think that hardware accelerated exporting in Premiere Pro is using the GPU, but no, it's not. That's actually using QuickSync on the CPU and only on some CPUs. <laughs> um, so it, it's it's a critical component. It's the first thing typically that we'd be talking about when it comes to like performance in NLEs. Um, and there is some really really interesting things. I might have to start referring to my phone to get oh, some actual sure. numbers here. Uh, but starting off with Premiere. Um, the where it gets really interesting is on the high end uh, market. When you are in the like uh, the Intel ninth gen and the AMD Ryzen's, it's not really all that much different in terms of price and performance. So you can kind of go either way. It just kind of depends on what you need. Like if you need Thunderbolt, you're probably going to want to stick with Intel. Uh, if you maybe want a better upgrade path because you think you might purchase uh, the next generation CPU and not skip two or three generations, then you might want to go AMD. It's probably a little bit better upgrade path. But in general, you can go either way and you'll be happy. Uh, it's when you get up to the X series and the Threadripper that things get super interesting. Um, and that's partly because of performance and it's partly because of the price drop that the X series had. Right. Because it was, it used to be that the X series and Threadripper were about the same price 
and so is whichever one performed better. Now, the X series is lower in price, Fred Roper's more expensive, and it actually kind of reflects that in something like Premiere Pro. So Premiere Pro, um, if you look at our you know benchmarks and all of our scores and all that kind of stuff, you'll see that it's pretty pretty darn close. Like you, you spend more money, you're gonna get better performance, and, and that, great, that's, that's nice and easy to wrap your hand around, right, you know, yeah. whether you get X3s or Thread Ripper. Um, but there are some nuances in there. Um, things like live playback, uh, that does not scale super well over a huge number of cores. So getting up into these you know, 12, 14, 16, 32 core processors, it doesn't really get you that much. So a lot of editors, they care about live playback performance. Right. They want to drop their footage in and start editing and not have to deal with proxies or transcoding. And for that, you actually get around to the, um, I think it's the 10, 9, 20, uh, X from the ninth gen, and or sorry, not ninth gen X series, <laughs> and that's about as good as you can get for live playback. You you know, bump up to the higher uh, X series uh, CPUs or the Threadripper, and it doesn't really change that much. So, in that sense, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it, where it does matter is exporting. So once you've done all your edits and you're going to export, the Threadrippers can be quite a bit faster. Now they're also more expensive. So it's, it's just like always the give and take is a faster export worth the higher costs or are you fine with just exporting overnight and that's fine. And I think a lot of that's just gonna come down to the individual. You know, someone that is doing like tutorials on YouTube, you know, it's like a 20 minute video, it's not a big deal. Um, you know, whether it takes 20 minutes or 25 minutes to export. Right. Someone who's doing a feature length, length film you know, two hours and they're exporting to, you know, some crazy codec that they need for like projectors and stuff. Yeah, that's, that's probably very significant. So, it, but the nice thing is, because Intel made that price drop, it is just about which one fits in your budget and which one, you know, how important export performance is. Right. Um, and that, that applies also to DaVinci Resolve to, to some degree too. DaVinci Resolve is a little bit different only because the really hard things to do in Resolve, open effects and noise reduction, that's almost entirely done on the video card. So your CPU isn't as important for that. It's just more like your CPU has to keep up. So it's not a matter of, you know, Threadripper is always going to be faster than X series. It's like, well, if X or Threadripper will probably be faster than X series as long as you have the GPU power to match. So like if you only have one video card, two video cards, you probably go either way. If you've got three or four or you know those crazy systems that have eight, well, yeah, you probably would want to go to Threader for just give you the extra power. So I don't mm -hmm. want to hold you to it or anything, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I probably promise the, the listeners won't either, but if you were uh, if you were to have to pick one CPU for, for various types of workflows, mm -hmm. so say say someone working uh, with 1080, one person with 4K, and one person who's working in that like 6K to 8K range, like what, what are they explicitly going to need? Uh, so the lower end stuff, like 4K and HD, you'd probably be just fine on like a Ryzen CPU. Um, and I would probably, and we're talking just pure performance here, um, I'd probably gravitate a little bit more towards Ryzen just because it's, it's a little bit better in a lot of the um, kind of our other applications, like After Effects is a little bit better and um, it is better in DaVinci Resolve by a, a little bit. And it's just, just overall a little bit better. So I think for those people, like the 4K and HD, probably go that way. There's there's reasons to go with the ninth gen, things like Thunderbolt, uh, sure. which is super important. But from a pure performance, probably Ryzen. Uh, once you get up into the 6K and 8K, um, then I just think it comes down to what matters to you. If it's live playback, save your money, don't get a throw or get a next series. If it is export performance, then well, you, could, you might be able to justify the high cost of the ex, of the Threadrippers. And between all the models within those, it just comes down to your budget. You right. pay more, you're gonna get better performance. You know, it's, it's usually not, it, it's not a linear scale, but, uh, but yeah. So there's not like a specific model, I would say, you need to buy this one when it comes to video editing, simply because it is all about um, price and performance. Right. Okay, so let's uh, let's pivot over one more time. I promise yeah. that'll be the last one, um, and let's talk a little bit about uh, motion graphics. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to pose the same question as, as video editing. Um, how how do these back how do these packages tend to use uh, CPUs and and kind of what impact are these CPUs going to have on these software packages? Yeah. Okay, so this one's also really interesting. So I mean, it, 
everything we're talking about is really super interesting to me because of the hardware it launches. Sure. Uh, but this, the software also is uh, very unique. Um, a lot of people think that, say, like After Effects is going to be similar to Premiere Pro. They're both made by Adobe. You both put video files into them. You both you know, export. Seems logical. Yeah, uh, but no, not really. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, because of the way it works and the, um, I forget how, how someone described it to me. This was someone from Adobe even. It's like Premiere Pro is optimized for live playback, you know, getting you as close to live playback as possible. After Effects is optimized for pixel perfect display because you're doing things, you know, down to the pixel. And uh, because of that, after Effects is actually very single threaded. So it's really only gonna use one or two cores on the CPU. So all these super crazy high-end processors like Threadripper, they don't really get you anything. Uh, same with the X-Series, really. So for most motion graphics, something like the, uh, the Core i9-9900K or the Ryzen 3900 or 3950X, that's about as good as you can get, and there's no reason to go higher. Uh, now, the reason why I was saying this is interesting on the software side right now is because that is starting to kind of shift, I think, a little bit. Um, and some of it is comes down to the specific application. So like After Effects, I think they, they teased at Adobe Max that they're bringing back some uh, parallel rendering in uh, After Effects. So yeah. that might totally change it. Um, after Effects, they also uh, are now have integration with Cinema 4D, and Cinema 4D does, you know, much better of using multiple CPU cores because that's doing um, uh, photorealistic rendering or what what is it called ray trace rendering, um, and that doesn't translate perfectly into After Effects actually right now. So if you just take a Cinema 4D uh, project and drop it into After Effects and hit render, it does not scale super crazy well across more cores, like people I think expect, but that's the direction that things are going. Um, and this is kind of industry-wide. I mean, you've got After Effects is the big one, but even Fusion kind of works along the same way. I don't know if they are putting in better uh, threading capabilities in, in like Fusion, uh, but a lot of these kind of ones, even when you get down to like Houdini and Nuke and stuff, um, the actual like animation side of things is fairly lightly threaded and it only comes into play when uh, you're actually like rendering ray traced stuff or doing simulations in some of these packages. So that's actually exactly uh, what I was gonna ask you next mm -hmm. is, uh, we talked a little bit about, uh, about this with Josh on the last episode, um, but I'm curious from, from your perspective uh, or kind of your context within this industry, uh, why you think it is that we have this arms race of, of core count happening between Intel and AMD Mm -hmm. uh, when a vast majority of software packages don't actually tend to use all those cores? Well, I think some of it is chicken and egg, honestly. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm not a software developer to that level at all. Like, I write benchmarks that run on, in JavaScript. Sure. Not, not <laughs> like what... Super you know, intense, yeah. Yeah. Not like what the like, After Effects devs are doing. But my understanding is making things run on more than one core is really, really, really hard. And we're getting to the point now where they're, they're getting good at it. So like they can scale up to two, three, four cores and that's okay. But when you get beyond that, you're getting up in like the core counts that we have, like 32 cores on Threadripper, like that's nuts. Like trying to actually make something that's gonna scale across that, you know, outside of very specific things like ray tracing where like you don't have to have any cross communication, right. uh, that's really hard. So, um, but at the same time, like they haven't had to do that until the last you know, four or five years as these CPUs are actually starting to come out. Uh, but to get back to your original question of why are AMD and Intel doing this, I mean, I think some of it is just because that's the only direction they have to go. Um, we're hitting the limits right. of you know how small you can make transistors, how fast each core can run. And they're still making improvements. Like every generation is about 10 or 15% faster in terms of single-threaded performance. And that's not from the frequency, uh, that's from all the other architectural changes and all this other stuff that's behind the scenes that you never see in marketing, like, you know, decks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's just the only direction they have to go. And what I am super interested actually in is as we get into these crazy high core counts, that's the kind of, the, the things that are really good at running on high number of cores are actually probably going to be better to just move off to the GPU. And we've kind of seen that. So um, a good example is, again, like ray trace rendering. I mean, a lot of people do use that for motion graphics. That's a little bit more on the VFX side. But 
they still use that a lot. And man, programs like Octane Render, Redshift, uh, which even Cinema 40 just you know purchased or partnered with one of those. Maxon but, bought Redshift. Yeah, Maxon bought Redshift. Um, like that's kind of the direction for those kind of things because anything that runs in highly parallel you're just going to put on the GPU because the GPU has 3,000 cores. Yeah. Right? yeah. Which, which only then makes you kind of question why, why you know, uh, as we continue to see more and more cores on, yeah. on the CPUs. And again, I think some of it is just that's the only direction they have to go. I mean, if they can't just consistently show a 10% performance gain, you know, generation after generation. I mean, for a long time, that's what it was. And things kind of stagnated. Yeah. Um, so they kind of have to do it that way. And there are still reasons to have high core count CPUs. There are some things that just aren't appropriate to run on the GPU. Um, things especially that have to have really high memory capacities. Right. Video cards don't have a huge amount of memory. Putting on the CPU, well, you can have a, a ton of memory. Um, and things like that, okay, you go there. There's also the whole argument of um, being able to run things in parallel, so like multitasking. And that does actually come into play in motion graphics some um, with like, After Effects in particular, they have uh, a little EXE that's called AE Render. And that's what uh, things like Render Garden and BG Render Max and all these other guys use to improve performance in uh, After Effects, specifically for exporting. Because all, and all those things do is it takes your project and then it just basically spawns multiple instances of After Effects. So you can spawn 20 instances of After Effects and tell like, okay, this instance, you render frame one to 10. You do frames 11 to 20. You do frames 20, 21 to 25. Sure. Uh, and it just does all that. And then, great, like there you go. Um, there's downsides to that. Like you need, if you're gonna spawn 20 instances of After Effects, you need 20 times the amount of RAM. You need 20 times the amount of video memory if you're using anything GPU accelerated. Right. So there's downsides, but that's like a brute force away of getting better performance. Yeah, and I, and I do think it'll be interesting to see once the once this hardware is in the software developer's hands mm -hmm. for an extended period of time, like it will be interesting to see long term whether or not we'll see the, uh, that software utilizing that hardware more and more. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's not like going from single core to dual core. I mean, we've had multi-core CPUs for a long time, exactly. but it really has only been, let's see, I think it was like two or three generations from like the X series, maybe, maybe four, which is like three or four years that we're getting core counts above like eight. And when it was eight and below, I think that there could be a lot of argument of just like, well, our application doesn't really have to be better at using more than four cores because you need cores to be doing everything else yep. that computers do. You have to run Chrome or Internet Explorer or whatever. And, but now we're having, you know, 24 or 32, there's no longer that argument of yeah, well, you need those other cores for other things. Like, no, you don't need 28 cores sitting you know, <laughs> idle. I mean, have you used Chrome? I have. <laughs> uh, but, so yeah, it will be interesting to see how much effort they spend on that. Because, I mean, at the same time, software developers, they have finite resources, they have finite time. Yeah. And what are they going to be able to concentrate on? And I see a lot more work being done, whether from Adobe or Blackmagic or anybody else, on things like AI and machine learning, yeah. um, all this stuff where it, it doesn't look all that impressive to you kind of when, when you run it because like, oh, I just hit go and it was done in half a second. But it's only, I hit go and it's done in half a second because they spent so much time developing for it. Right. And if they took that same amount of time and spent that on like improving multi-threading, it probably wouldn't have been ended up as fast. So it is gonna be interesting to see like how they decide to spend their limited resources, do they spend it on improving multi-threading capability, or do they spend it on GPU acceleration, or do they spend it on AI and machine learning stuff to, you know, because at the end of the day, the I would hope the goal, their goal, is to let people create things and create faster and more efficiently and, you know, cooler things, and how you they achieve that, I, man, I, I don't know, there's so many different routes they could go. Right. So taking a step back from uh, from kind of the technical capabilities mm -hmm. or the uh, technical specs of these of these CPUs, what are you excited about for kind of the the larger impact uh, that these CPUs might have on kind of the industry at least that you focus on? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing, and I don't think this is even my the industries that I focus on. I think this is just overall is that 
competition is good and AMD is sure competing now. I mean, there are so many places where they are just like, no, Intel's not even part of the conversation anymore. Uh, but at the same time, Intel is a massive company with ginormous R&D capability. Yeah. And so it might take a year or two or however long it takes for Intel to like, you know, really double down and say, okay, we're gonna come out on, you know, on top again. But, you know, giant companies like AMD and Intel, and, you know, to a position like NVIDIA even too, like anytime you can get them to compete, man, everybody's gonna win. You know, it's either gonna result in lower prices. I was about to say, I mean, you already see that with the price drops for with mm -hmm. Intel, so. Yeah, yeah, the X-Series, they cut the prices almost in half. Like, great, that's a win for everybody. Um, the Threadripper stuff is you know, kind of bonkers in so many different things. Uh, Ryzen's amazing, and so, yeah, when you have those kind of arm races, like Intel has been so stagnant for so long. Like, I, I personally think that Intel does a great job, but I also think that too, they've kind of you know, let their foot off the gra gas because there's no reason to spend all this money on R&D for these things. Right. I mean, because CPUs is not all Intel does. Like Intel does, I, I don't even know how much Intel does. I probably don't want to know how much <laughs> Intel does. But, um, so they're, they're spending a lot of that money, you know, other places in, I, I'm assuming they're going to have to bring it back and start spending it there. And what that's going to result in, who knows? Like I saw something, I think even just today, it was about Intel working on quantum computing stuff, like make it affordable. And like quantum computing is not going to replace traditional computing, but it might like um, enhance it or be used for some things. And so, yeah, it's, it's arm, I don't want to call it really an arms race because that's kind of, negative but sure, uh, yeah. uh but like this, the competition competition is great yeah well somehow we made it from uh photography to quantum computing here yeah so i probably should wrap it up now <laughs> well uh thank you for coming on Absolutely. and uh, providing your insights on this and uh feel free to uh, jump on for the next episode where we'll be focusing on 3d design and rendering